And they have certain characteristics associated with them. One of the obvious ones is they don't have endocannabinoid systems. And you compare that to deuterostomes, which have the endocannabinoid system, and then you look and you see what came out of that over the past you know, hundreds of millions of years, and there we are. Maybe a little more advanced in the, you know, in the more recent times, because really the time from when we were that to what we are now is you know, infinitesimal in terms of the evolution of the biosphere. You know, it's nothing. So, what's really going on here? Is, can we really see something fundamentally different between these things that we can attribute to the endocannabinoid system and that has relevance to us today in terms of health? Again, as individuals and as societies, and as the biosphere as a whole. So, proteostomes are successful at survival. You look at today's cockroach, and it looks pretty much like you know, it did millions and millions of years ago. But look at us and how we've changed, you know, going back from you know, just looking at in terms of uh, you know, reptiles, amphibians, and birds, and mammals, just at that, in that little short period of time, which is really only a couple hundred million years. We've had such an incredible change, whereas the cockroaches have remained the same. All right? So, deuterostomes are successful at evolving. And what do we really mean by that? Does successful mean a hypervariable interface? What do we mean by that? Well, here we have a collection, right? And if things can't flow in and out of that collection, they can't maintain their distance from equilibrium. Think of us, right? If we can't eat and we can't get rid of our waste, we die, right? We need constantly to extract from our environment the energy and the information necessary to maintain our organization, to nourish our organization, and to nourish our creativity. All right? So, consciousness and, and the immune system are prime examples of what I mean by hypervariable interface. And we'll go into that in a second and how this all connects to the, um, to, to the uh, endocannabinoid system and to marijuana essentially. So disciplinary structures are these flow-dependent structures that I'm talking about, like in the petri dishes that I showed you, like in ourselves. If we sealed off this room and had no air coming in and out, no food going in and out, it would take some time, but we would all get sick, weaker, die, rot, go back to equilibrium. So essentially health is distance from equilibrium. All right? So disciplinary structures are flow-dependent, and what flows? Energy and mass, that's what we're taking into us, right? We're taking in information, and we're taking in food. So what makes flow? Feeding. And the fact that you can take in one end and get it out the other end, all right? And that we can extract out of that the energy to power our existence. What monitors and drives the flow is our immune system and our nervous system. Both of these are fundamentally controlled by endocannabinoids. All right? So what happens essentially is this. Around 650 million years ago or so, nobody knows exactly, but in that range, cells started to talk to one another. And the first cells that started to talk to, get to one another formed a, multi -cell, a simple multicellular organism, sponges. They have a very primitive immune system. They have a little bit of communication ability, but they're pretty dumb. You know? That, in turn, led to a new organism to where there was a little indent. And that little indent was now a form of specialization. It was an anus and a mouth. Not the most appetizing situation, not the most efficient situation. And evolution always selects for greater efficiency. All right? So that indent became a tube. And now that tube could form in either of two ways. It could form head first, which is what the proteostomes are, or it could form butt first which is what we are. And certainly judging from uh, drug policies, we we're all pretty certain that we need to form butt first, you know, because, we, because the guidance of our leadership is clearly ass backwards, right? <laughs> all right, so what I want to tie this into now is the idea of free radicals and stress, all right? So here we have life, we have flow coming into us, we have flow going out of us, we're taking in the goodies, we're getting rid of the baddies, so to speak, all right? Well, we have to have a, an interface with our environment to accomplish this. And as long as things are going smoothly, we're not stressed. And when I say stress, I don't mean just stress of us as an organism, 
an individual organism. I mean stress on a subcellular level when the cells sense change, when cells that are talking to one another sense change, when us as an organism senses change. And some, some change can be good or bad, but it's still a biochemical stress in that it requires change. And what happens is, as soon as you have an, an impairment, essentially, of the flow, our bodies generate free radicals. Our cells generate free radicals. All right? And free radicals are believed to be behind aging and age-related illnesses. What they are is are very reactive chemicals. So instead of playing nicely with every, all the other chemicals, as soon as you have a free radical, it goes and does whatever it wants, which means it reacts with everything else, and everything else has to be flowing in harmony, optimally, to maintain the organization's health. The health characterized by organization, because as soon as you start screwing around by reacting with the wrong things, you're you're basically screwing up the organization and the flow. So, two things can happen. On the one hand, our cells will recognize perturbations by virtue of the free radicals and different ways that our biochemistry will change the flow in response to sensing an imbalance in our, in our environment. All right? So they respond to the stress successfully, ideally, and reestablish biochemical pathways that are now in harmony with the environment that's nourishing us, all right? And the better you can do that, the less stressed you are. And cannabis is like a primal anti-stress system, our endocannabinoid system. It helps relieve stress on that cellular level, on the more organized level of systems, like a nervous system, immune system, digestive system, etc. And in our minds as well. You know, we all know too much stress is not healthy for you. Why is it not healthy for you? Because it's really a representation of what's going on within you and the stress that's occurring within you. That's just symbolic, essentially. But we see that on all of these different levels of complexity of organization, that the cannabinoid system, our endocannabinoids, the pot that we make, out of essential fatty acids, which everybody says how good, make your omega-3s and blah, 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 right? Why are they good? They are how you make your endocannabinoids, all right? So when you hear everybody saying, take omega-3s, take essential fatty acids, it's so you can, your body can make more pot. That's the bottom line, all right? Why? Because they know that that's good for you, but they only speak about it in terms of the, you know, the omega-3s and the essential fatty acids. They're not saying it's because your body needs more pot, and this is how you get it. All right, so that's that's part of it, and that's you know has to do with these stress-relieving properties of the cannabinoid system as it permeates through us. So when a distributive structure has an altered flow with its environment, is the endocannabinoids is the endocannabinoid system responsible for the evolution of human intelligence as a result of how it deals with stress? All right, so is it an evolutionary tool to create and then rebalance excess flow? Now, why do I say create? and rebalance. Because remember, all of this organization, all of this life is dependent on flow. 